papers. Let me get to my, um, of course I've got PowerPoint, but I'll also take you over and show you some of these value calculators. The way that I got connected with Leland is some of the posts that I've made on LinkedIn around the value calculators and taking an economic view. So he reached out to me. I am thrilled to share with you. So, uh, this is a conglomeration and abstraction of, of three different one hour topics that I've often presented at other meetups and Safe Summit, uh, the Agile 2021 did a workshop. So um, that's me. I am a safe program consultant trainer. I really focus on hardware inclusive systems. The last two years I've been consulting with one of the top five military defense contractors in the US, also helping them with digital transformation. I've worked with some of the leading medical device manufacturers, uh, automotive. Um, so it's always hardware inclusive systems. Agile for hardware, is it a thing? Oh my gosh, uh, it is really, uh, taking off, so to speak, <laughs> thanks to uh, SpaceX and others who have made Agile uh, more expansive than just in software systems. I have many more years of experience in model-based systems engineering than Agile and SAFE, and I love bringing those all together with design thinking. Now, when I went through the SPCT program and I was required to read um, Reinertsen's book on the principles of product development flow, suddenly my whole language around Agile and SAFE changed. I don't talk about Agile and SAFE for the you know, purpose of Agile and SAFE. It's all about the economics of value delivery um, and that Agile and SAFE and Lean uh, are all a means to getting that the economics improved. So then I expanded that into quantified scenarios and now value calculators, because I found the power in translating what is it we need to do and convincing leadership in particular on how to change the system that people work in, that talking about it in the language of money really motivates change uh, often in ways that we're not easily successful just by talking about it. Um, and I'm going to talk about value there. <laughs> One of the key metaphors I use uh, in visual sense making is this picture. When I grew up in South Texas, it was uh, south of Houston, I grew up in Angleton, Texas, my dad would say, don't leave the front door open. I can't afford to air condition the whole neighborhood, <laughs> right? You probably heard that, said it. Um, and it's that idea that he didn't see the dollars flying out the front door, but he knew where the money was going. And there's this energy currency in an organization that we want to implant this idea that if our system is inefficient in helping people use their energy appropriately to streamline the flow of value, then it's just like letting the dollar bills, the energy currency fly out the doors and windows. So we need to think about where are those leaks in the energy and how can we control those? So I have three examples here. The first one, controlling work in process. This is a story problem from my 2019 um, Safe Summit presentation on uh, taking an economic view. And you know, you know what Safe says um, maybe about controlling WIP. You know, it's a good thing to do. Um, in fact, one technique they offer is putting WIP limits on the state's of the work as it flows through the system. But what I have found, and I'm sure you've lived this, is that the biggest challenge with controlling work and process is this horrible thing that we do to people by piecemealing them and assigning 10% to this project and 20% to that project and so on and so forth, right? So I said, oh, how can we how can we help people stop do, doing that? Well, first we have to convince them that there is an impact and what better way than to talk about the economic impact. So I use this scenario 
a real person, Tina. Uh, she's a mechanical engineer and a database administrator at Siemens Health and Ears in Knoxville, Tennessee. She uh, has these two projects she works on. So I said, Tina, how do you how do you really negotiate the different work? And she said, well, on Mondays and Wednesdays, I do my DBA work. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, I do mechanical engineering. And on Friday, that's where I focus on overhead. I said, oh, so people really know that. And they only call you with a mechanical engineering question on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And she said, no, no, of course not. It's very disruptive. Disruptive. We live in a disruptive, shoulder tapping kind of work environment. So I said, well, what, what does research tell us that we can use to quantify the impact? And you can see here, uh, average of 25 minutes to resume a task after being interrupted. Um, yes, when you're in that deep thinking mode of work, um, which are high tech environments, um, even business process analysis, right? To really get back into that deep thinking. It's kind of like REM sleep. You know, if you've had a, a, a small baby or a puppy in the house, you know, you don't just immediately get back into that depth um, that is so beneficial. And you can see the other research here this research, what, scrum.org, scaled agile? Nope, this is from the American Psychological Association. So, so we're gonna hone in on that 25 minutes to resume a task, um, but I wanna show you this other uh, sound bite I found, uh, and this is one that really sticks with me. right? Heavy multitasking can temporarily lower your IQ by up to 15 points. Did your company hire the best, smartest people it could find just so that it could make them dumber <laughs> by overloading them with too many different projects and all this con context switching and multitasking? Well, of course not. Of course not. But let's I said, well, let's just take that one number of 25 minutes. Every time I get interrupted from my deep thinking flow of work, what if there's a 25 minute tax on that, right? Yeah, and it's gradual, but I said, what's the difference in cost? What if I could just be heads down all day, every day, eight hours, then I have one instance of ramp up time. What if I could work four hours heads down versus two versus one? And which one of us wouldn't relish one hour of heads down, non-interrupted time? So I, I looked at the, the cost. I said, what, what does it cost our friend Tina for these different um, amounts of, of deep thinking time. What if we put a number around it? And I normalized it with a $100 per hour resource cost, which probably for Tina is too low. But here's the thing. I pick numbers that are just, that are believable enough. If people will say, oh yes, it's at least that much. Then I can say, well, our friend Tina here, if she can only get one hour at a time, for deep thinking and everything else is disrupted, that's a cost, the, the cost of context switching is 66,667. No coincidence that it has 666 in there, right? It's evil, it's satanic. And I say to people, okay, well, then you'd have to hire another, you know, half to a third of a Tina just to compensate for the context switching time. And I show this to executives and their first question is, how do I fix that? And that's exactly what we're after. How do I fix that? So I took it a step further and I created this calculator because some people want to adjust these parameters. And I'll show you that this is really the underlying thinking of these um, value calculators is it's, it's, it doesn't have to be a precise number. 
It's looking at the what if scenarios and trying to get a quantification and say, yes, it's at least that much. Executives say to me, oh, I think 25 minutes is too high. Okay, <laughs> well, how many tens of thousands of dollars per year per person are you willing to tolerate? <laughs> Okay, so here's my calculator and I'm gonna take you over and show you, um, I'm gonna show you the calculator on our website. So if you go to projectandteam.com um, and I hide that and it always comes back. Um, if you go to projectandteam.com and go to learning value calculators, I don't collect information about you. It's not a marketing ploy. This is just to advertise um, my visible expertise. So here, the value calculator for the cost of context switching. I, um, it's just pretty simple. You can select, oh, well, what if it's, what if I do get two hours? Uh, what if the, the ramp up time is 20 minutes, not, 25. And what if I expand, plan to be productive five days a week? Uh, but what if I live in Germany and, and get six weeks vacation every year? And what if the people in my organization have an average burden cost that's higher? Okay, so that's, it, it calculates in real time. And we can say, oh my gosh, all this heavy context switching equates to three and a half million dollars per year. That's pretty compelling. That's pretty compelling. Um, and so I do have an extension to uh, this presentation that talks about ways that we can uh, control that. But I mean, the obvious one that just jumps in your face is quit piecemealing people. Look at the trade-off of, of mentoring and, and developing new skills um, versus having these strict skill specializations that cause us to piecemeal people. And our resource management systems don't think about people as people. They think of them as machines and that you can you know, segment the operating system into different threads of work that can, you know, multi-process. And, and the reality is not represented there, as you know. Okay, I'm gonna go through this kind of fast and I wanna allow time for asking questions. So my second, my second um, segment, and you can find uh, a recording um, from where I did an RTE circle for um, Rentouch, the PI Planning .o folks, uh, a full hour on the economics of program increment planning. Because this is what we hear uh, most often as a safe consultant, right? Um, we hear from Dean Leffingwell himself, there may be nothing magic and safe except the program increment planning. And I've heard him say that. And I say, what makes it magic? What is that magic? Can I quantify the magic? And so that's what I looked at. Now, what I realized, um, what hit me last year working with this military defense contractor, where we just, I said, we've got to focus on outcomes, got to focus on outcomes. Well, I found that the way people talk about outcomes and value, oh, it's, it's really uh, the biggest challenge is getting people aligned on what constitutes our currency of value and how do we measure it? What are our KPIs? What are our measurements? And I realized that people will talk conceptually about value and outcomes like, oh, if we, if we implement digital work instructions in manufacturing, it will uh, improve quality and uh, reduce the cycle time to get a product out to our customer. Okay, okay. <laughs> how do you define cycle time? Is it from when the contract started till when it's integrated and part of a product? Is it when it leaves the manufacturing floor? How do you define quality? 
Is it uh, scrap and rework? Is it defects found once the, pro you, the physical product leaves your manufacturing floor? And so we talk conceptually, but then I talk about the quantified value. Okay, so how are we gonna measure? What are the parameters around quality? Scrap and rework, what are, what are the, the units of measure? What are the uh, tolerances, the, the low and high value ranges, right? And that's what I use in my quantified scenarios. So if we took PI planning and we said, well, you're, you know, we're safe consultants, we're like, oh, we've got to do PI planning because it's a complex system and it helps us identify dependencies across teams. Okay, well, your system may be well architected organizationally and have few dependencies across teams. My system may have may very skill-based siloed teams, especially in hardware, types of hardware. And um, I may have a significant number of dependencies across teams. So the value for me and the value for you could be quite different in magnitude. And so this is why I create these value calculators so people can really represent their own um, context. Now, you start to talk about measurement and numbers and people think there has to be some precision. And they say, oh, measuring things is hard. I can't instrument people. <laughs> and yes, that's true. Um, if we wanted to measure it, if we had a good way to measure, and as we're moving to more digital solutions, we are getting better at that. It's, it's well, I don't say we're getting better, it's getting easier to measure. Uh, or it could be proven. So this is kind of the states of value, the way that I look at it and represented it to that contractor last year. But quantified, if our goal is just to help people understand the benefit of doing things in a different way, then the quantified is what we need. In fact, I looked, I said, where's the magic? And I looked through all the safe training classes. Yes, everyone. And all the videos you can find online where people even in different languages are, are expressing the value of PI planning. And I, and I captured this extensive list of where's the value. And I do have... I have value calculators represented in Excel. I have a lot, a larger set represented in Excel than I have in online calculators. Um, but these are the three that I honed in on, and I'm going to show you why. These tend to be sufficient to justify the value of PI planning. And I'm going to show you an example. This is a customer I worked with. Uh, in uh, Washington state who builds smart devices for uh, utilities. And they said, oh, we can't do PI planning. It, we would have to fly 17 people from Minnesota and 22 people from Bangalore and the travel costs would just make it completely untenable. Okay, well, you're just looking at the cost side. What, what if we could quantify the benefit side? And so um, I, I did that for them and I'll show you some of the details there. Um, I said, even if we looked at the low side versus what we see as the high side and the common, what we see commonly for improved productivity, and I'm gonna, Drill down on that in the next slide. Uh, reduction in alignment meetings, managing dependencies in PI planning, just the logistics of meetings, um, catching a dependency early to reduce a late integration defect, access to a subject matter expert. So this is, this is all I needed to convince leadership at that organization not only that the benefit of PI planning was um, justified the cost, but they would be darn stupid 
<laughs> to, to not do it, right? And they did it. And the benefits, um, you know, that they have realized, um, I find with PI planning, once you do it, it's very, very hard to get the participants to go back to not doing it. But that's another conversation. So on the low side, we said, if we quantified the benefits, that's $266,000 easily justifies the cost. And the bulk of that, yes, you have noticed is in this improved productivity. So where did that come from? Well, if we looked at how many people are in the agile release train, uh, hourly cost per person, et cetera, et cetera. So the improved productivity from motivation, right, is looking at for a program increment, which is roughly a quarter of work, we looked at the case studies from Scaled Agile, which by the way, said 20 to 50% improved productivity. And I said, okay, all I need to do is to prove that 5% improvement of productivity is enough to justify it. So I did low, medium, and high here, but my high, <laughs> was the lowest on the scaled agile scale. Why? Because people are skeptical and, you know, understandably so. So um, then reduced meetings, I, I'm not going to dwell on that here. So I do have a calculator for that. And um, this, this one is about finding and testing dependencies early, right? We've all seen the data for all of our careers and you know, I have a pretty long career. <laughs> and that says, you know, the orders of magnitude more expensive it is the later that you find a defect. But I wanted to allow people to do their own analysis. So this calculator again, how long is the average defect discovery in hours, the triage effort, blamestorming. I don't know about you, but when I get called into a room with a lot of highly paid executives, <laughs> you know, it's like the Spanish Inquisition um, versus the defect remediation, number of dependencies. My first agile and safe uh, consulting uh, transformation was with a group that builds a nuclear missile that supports planning for the nuclear missile defense system in the US. And I said, well, what defines success for you? And the program manager said, well, look, at our last release, we had 200 defects that got released into the product. <laughs> and I said, oh, 200 defects in the planning for the nuclear missile defense system, that's a, uh, what did your customers say? <laughs> and she said, well, our customer's military. So he said things that I cannot repeat to you. Um, but that was really what they honed in on. Obviously, those defects were not major defects. But what you experience in your own organization may be different. And if you have these parameters, you can start to look at things like, well, Maybe we need to streamline our DevOps pipeline so that our defect remediation does not take so long. Maybe we need to shorten our cycles and integration testing so that the magnitude of the work that we did to search through for triage is smaller. How, you know, so looking at the different parameters helps us analyze not only what should we stop doing in terms of let's identify dependencies and do integration testing early, but, but what are you know, these different levers, if you will, in the parameters that, that we can analyze? Oh, we could outsource everything to a low cost country. <laughs> okay, so um, then the, the kind of complementary calculator is managing dependencies in PI planning. And, and this is the thing that people, I, I talk a lot about the cost 
of what I call the noise of when. When are you going to schedule that meeting? When are you available? When am I available? You know, Jim, I saw you on the line. Jim could say, hey, Cindy, can, can we get together for 30 minutes and talk about those calculators? And he sends me an email and I send him an email and somebody else reschedules and blah, blah, blah. Jim and I could easily, with all the disruptions, spend 30, 45 minutes trying to schedule a 30 minute conversation, right? It's painful and that's, it's so pervasive. That is energy that is leaching, leaching out of the building, right? The, the air conditioning is just flowing through the whole neighborhood. So one of the reasons I wanted to build this calculator was to help make that point. How many teams do we have in PI planning? The percentage of the team stories with a dependency, I probably should have rearranged that, but the average number of stories per team per program increment, percentage of these team dependencies with a cascade, meaning if I committed to give you something in the second iteration, but then we need to renegotiate that, then there's a cascading dependency uh, on another team that needs something from that. Right, so I, I wanted to represent that aspect of, you know, dependencies are not always completely uh, independent. Um, so, I mean, you can always choose zero for that. Burden cost, average minutes to negotiate one dependency during PI planning per team. Now, then I said, well, what happens at, if I don't manage those in PI planning, if I don't have PI planning? Oh, somebody's got to schedule a dependency negotiation meeting for each dependency, the average minutes to attend them. And oh, guess what? There's context switching minutes. And you can tweak these, but it's this simple example shows you $22,000 I can save just by managing these, negotiating these in PI planning. Any savings sounds like a good justification to me. And we can examine these different parameters. I know I'm talking pretty fast. I'm just gonna move on to my third one again so I have time to for questions. So this is just a summary of the kinds of the points that I've been trying to make. If you look at the different practices in PI planning and compare them, you know, is access to a subject matter expert really the biggest economic value or is it the managing dependencies? Is it hearing the executives talk about the business context and rallying around a common vision. Because we have, you know, we have some options in terms of where do we really invest? Where do we really look for the best outcomes from that uh, investment in two days of PI planning? Okay, the last one, this is my favorite because it's pretty intense. I looked at the book Team Topologies. Have you read it, Skelton and Pays? I love that book. They put a really lovely taxonomy and visual sense making around these concepts we struggle with. You know, we talked about component based teams and feature based teams, but they give us more. And uh, I love it. Uh, I digested it one little sentence at a time because I said, okay. I want to help my customers apply this, but I have some real customer experiences and I'm thinking back on those and I'm thinking, wow, how did I advise them and how does it relate to this? So let's, let's walk through this really quickly. Um, last year, I worked with uh, a company that was moving all of their internal applications from data centers to cloud-based hosting. So suddenly they were afforded this ability to do uh, AI and analytics. 
And so I said, ooh, so they've got these specialists in AI and analytics. Um, and then there are these set of teams, each of those teams that owned a product, an internal product like, you know, Outlook and Skype and uh, those kinds of things, SAP, um, and teams that need AI and analytics now that they can get them from the cloud. How are we going to allocate these people? Are we going to put one specialist on each team? Um, are we going to keep the specialized component team? Or are we going to use the model from team topologies? They call it an interaction model, um, the as a service model. And I just, I made it my third option. Look at this. Okay. If you haven't seen, if you haven't read the book, here's the reference. Um, so I, I, because I always look at the world from how would I measure that? What are the parameters, <laughs> right? Um, I looked at team topologies from that perspective and I said, okay, well, wh what do we need to think about? How many people with that competency do we have? How long does it take to develop and maintain the competency? How many teams need it? How does it, long does it take to provide it? So this teasing apart, how would we measure supply and demand? And this was really inspired by a group at a aerospace company I worked with. They had seven thermal analytics specialist supporting an organization of 200 people. So roughly 20 different projects. So I, and, and this is what I talked them through. This was with four team topologies. And I said, well, how important is it that you understand the context of each project that you're applying thermal analytics? Oh my gosh, that's hugely important. And how critical is it that we're consistent in how we apply thermal analytics across each of these projects? Well, it's unique to each project, so that's not as important. Another example is the, the cloud-based hosting team where they had information security, right? So how critical was it that they understood how Outlook works versus how Skype works, how, you know, SAP? Not as critical, but how critical is it that we apply our information security rules consistently across all these applications. Oh, critically important, right? So how do we, how do we compare those things? Because that's part of what we need to know, okay? Do I allocate one wizard per team? These are what uh, Pays and Skelton call stream aligned teams. This would be in my cloud basic example, this, this would be the Outlook team, this would be the Skype team, this would be the Salesforce team. Do I allocate one per team? Well, that would, you know, that seems like the most efficient thing if I can do it because then these specialists are less likely to be impediment to the flow of value. That sounds cool, but does it make good economic sense? Well, if we have enough people with the competency to support each team, sure, let's do it. We also need to make sure that the people with the competency will be you know, fully engaged. Um, but if we don't have enough, in the case of my thermal analytics team, and it, it, I mean, you go to school, to get a degree in thermal analytics, right? It's pretty intense. Can't just go hire me some more. Um, so if we don't have this, then we need to understand how many people in addition we would need and what would be the investment. And if that investment is unacceptable, well, let's look at the next option. So then I said, what if I keep them together as a complicated subsystem team and they provide help on demand? Well, where does this go wrong? 
I've seen this. I've seen it with the information security team in several organizations. <laughs> we encapsulate this help behind ServiceNow or some kind of demand-based scheduling system and they become the bottleneck. They become the bottleneck to the flow of value. And they don't care because they think information security, the world revolves around them. <laughs> Maybe it does, but if all we had was information security and no customer facing value, what, what good would we be? So we find the balance. So the considerations here, the ratio of supply to demand, and then what would be the resulting bottleneck to our stream aligned teams. If understanding the stream aligned teams context is significant, I can't just switch Bob in for this request and Ellen in for this re request and Rahul in for this one, <laughs> because then there's so much cognitive load, if you will, on the stream align team for teaching that specialist their context every time, right? So we also need to consider this need for discovery. Maybe AI and analytics is really new in this organization and we're kind of learning what is it that we want to do as an organization? What are our success patterns, AKA best practices, right? So just a, a quick summary, if the risk of bottlenecks is high, let's consider our third option, what I call competency as a service. Pays and Skelton call it the as a service interaction model, but I see it as an implementation, right? So if we took, let's just say we took information security and let's say we're a banking customer and know your customer, the Patriot Act, and we said, oh, well, let's look at the 80% of what information security features the streamline teams need. And what if we built something like know your customer identification uh, as a service? What if we built um, single sign on? I'm just spitballing here, but different aspects of information security what if, you know, encryption rules um, and all of that, what if we supplied it as a service so that our streamlined teams could self-serve without imposing too much cognitive load, right? The things they have to keep in their head at any given point of time. And we enable them. Part of our wizards are building this uh, as a service Part of them are enabling these teams to be self-sufficient. And of course, there's probably oh, this other 20% that requires specialized component kind of model. But this is what my, so, so this summarizes, um, what's the effort to build and maintain it? What's the effort to educate and support? And so here I'm looking at cognitive load. Skelton and Pays talk a lot about cognitive load and improving flow. I look at cognitive load. I also look at collaboration load and communication load, right? Because it's not just what do I have to keep in my head at a certain point in time, but this collaboration of I've got to teach you my context before you can provide me that service. So I bake all that into this calculator. I call it an advisor. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details for you. Oh, if we only had a tool. And yes, I do. So this is a five page advisor. <laughs> and it walks you through page by page. Um, I normally work through it with my customers, um, just because there's so much involved there. So let me go over to, let's go over to 
this calculator and I have a I have a confession to make here. Um, this calculator, I, I've been <clears throat> I've been replatforming my calculators over the last few weeks um, because my original platform called ucalc.pro is a Russian-owned company. So I felt morally obligated to switch. And so I switched over to Outgrow. And this calculator is the last one I actually <laughs> implemented most of it yesterday. Um, it's not quite finished, but I'm going to show you how you can understand it better without uh, finishing this last page. So here's my step one, identify the competency, the scope and the current supply. I won't walk you through every parameter. Um, oh, it's gonna require me to, uh, it's gonna require me to put the mandatory things in here. Luckily it captured from my testing. Okay. Um, and so, you know, you can walk through it and it builds up the results and uh, um, I have to, and then it gives you a recommendation based on these values. I just wanted you to see that this is, uh, it's the same idea as a value calculator because there's parameters, there's results, but it is going the step further of advising you, right? If the ratio is greater than this and the percentage of time is this, but it's all, you know, here it gets more nuanced. It's not, oh, the cost of context switching is three and a half million dollars a year. It's, it's more of a discussion uh, nuance. So, so that is there. What <clears throat> my last slide shows you is you can get a guide on this um, and you can download it, but it walks you through every single step. Oh, that's, that's what it looked like in UCalc. <laughs> that's my old screenshots, but um, it just walks you through and for, I've worked with some people who say, well, I really want to understand the underlying calculations. And I've made those visible through this document. And then here's my thermal analytics competency example and how we came to a solution uh, recommendation on that. And then a regulatory compliance competency. Oh, that one is not in here. So, um, that is my most sophisticated. I have built um, I have built custom value calculators for customers and had a lot of discussions with people about other things that they want to quantify. And um, so that's oh, that's a lot of stuff. You can go back and, and listen to the recording. I would love to talk to you more about these specific elements, but we have 10 minutes now for questions. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, we did have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, okay. So one of them was, how do you initiate the conversation with the team? In other words, if cost is the not, not the primary driver, what would motivate a team to make a change um, for you know, kind of anything we've presented here? Oh, that's a really great question. Thank you so much. So we have to think about if you say to the team, well, we want to, uh, we, we could use WIP limits to help um, improve the flow uh, of what we're doing within our team. Then we would start with the conversation about, well, how long does it normally take us to get something from our backlog all the way through to um, product owner uh, approval? And where are the bottlenecks? And then we just have to tease apart 
what are the parameters around that? Is it the number of people that we have available to do testing? And, you know, could we have developers test each other's work? which I have done as a development manager. So sometimes it's just the conversation about what are our options. If we wanted to tease it down a little further, we could say, well, how much effort would it save to have developers each test their own work? Or let's compare that. What is the cost savings in, let's just say hours? if that's our unit of value that we care about, what's the cost savings in hours doing that versus implementing uh, a DevOps pipeline with automated CI, CD, uh, you know, continuous integration, continuous deployment. And there we might say, well, there's a dollar cost associated with getting some licenses or getting training on, you know, uh, even open source tools. And so then we might say, well, now we're talking hours over here and dollars over here. And we went, might want to normalize that around dollars, right? So you can see the progression in thought from conceptually, if we did this, this would get better. Do we believe that enough to take that step? Good. Then we don't need to spend the time um, quantifying. My second example was, well, we could do A or we could do B. We don't know which one is going to be more cost effective. So maybe we put some parameters around it and do some analysis. What I have learned is some people don't like math. <laughs> I have a really good friend who is a technical fellow at Boeing. And she says to me, I don't like to do math. I hire people to do math for me. <laughs> and so it kind of blows my mind because my degree's in math and I love to do this stuff. I love to do this stuff all the time. So you also have to temper it with your comfort level and how much effort it's going to be to do the analysis of parameters and the quantification. So that was kind of a long answer to how you get started. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Um, before I, there was one more question in the chat, but before I do that, uh, does anyone want to come off of unmute or type another question in the chat? You know, I'll just make an observation. I've, for years, I've told people uh, you should estimate at the minimum a buck a minute per person for meetings or any other activity. Uh, your 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 calculators are much more sophisticated, Cindy. But that's even that provides a baseline, which is pretty low, to gives people some idea. And the other number I throw in is, for every dollar of R and D that you spend, you have to make about five dollars in revenue. So, and again, that's just kind of a a, a ballpark number you throw out there. Uh, what are you doing for the next five minutes that's going to be worth twenty five bucks to our customer? Oh. Simple question. Yeah, was that Ned, were you the one? Yes, this is Ned speaking. Ned, I love that, I love that. You know, I, I have this vision of walking into a conference room and, and, and the meter reads your badge and it knows your, your cost per hour. And then it's like uh, in a taxi cab where you see the, the number spinning. I keep yep. thinking how efficient would our meetings be if we just saw the dollars? accumulating yeah, this is costing us 23 24 dollars there's 24 participants in this meeting right now right so so the cost of this meeting was something like 1200 bucks ah, yes wow i hope we got that much value out of it and i did and i hope other oh, people did too. oh thank you thank you good because you'll get my bill for one million dollars no um it, it's it's true and then the other thing about our see if you if you quantify then it helps keep people focused. And I think that's your point, Ned, is um, because in R&D, we do uh, at IBM, I saw a lot of R&D stuff at IBM and people can spend a lot of money just thinking and analyzing and what ifing. 
And what you said is a great way to keep them focused on getting to an outcome. Thank you. Just following on with that, we talk about in, in Agile, when you don't understand a problem, you often will have something called a spike. Yes. And the manager by saying, here's how much time you can spend on that spike is also providing an estimate of the risk associated with getting that question answered. Oof. Nice, nice. I like it. So we did have one more question from the chat um, and I can't remember exactly where this came in the presentation, so my apologies, but how are you defining productivity in the case study? Mm, let's see which case study. Um, probably, yeah. you were probably talking about the value of PI planning. Okay, uh, yeah, that's where we talk about, um, because I had this, right? Improved productivity in solution delivery, right? So, the way that, yes, productivity can be measured in many different forms. Um, what I did in this case is I just relied on the safe case studies that said 20 to 50% improved productivity, which um, if, you, if you look at how the case studies define it, it's really uh, the cycle time, uh, the the amount of value provided per unit of effort. And what I did here, I just said the total people on the art times the average cost per person um, times the number of weeks per PI times the productive hours per week, right? And so there's a subjective part. If we said people, need 20% overhead, but we assume their productivity is 32 hours per week, then I just said, well, the, here's the total cost of that. If we can improve productivity by 5%, then roughly we get $192,000 more value, more productivity, out of this um, roughly 1.6 hours more productivity. That's the calculation that I used here. You know, so if you define productivity in a different way, you know, you can, you can create your own parameters. But your question was, how did I define productivity? And there it is. <laughs> Well, thank you for that explanation. So we are at time. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for uh, coming and participating. Uh, good questions. And so, uh, and Cindy, thank you so much for all of this valuable information and the website. Um, we will post the recording link uh, when it's on YouTube uh, and ho hopefully next week. And uh, yeah, I'll look forward to seeing everyone out again next month. So um, thanks again, Cindy. Appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Okay. See you. Okay. Bye-bye.